So just before we start, I want to um, give you a brief overview of the importance of parallel programming and just some of the um, some of the capabilities of Python um, in, in, in doing HPC applications. And so, okay, so I'm going to talk about, um, just give you a brief uh, overview of trends in high-performance computing, the importance of parallel, um, common parallel platforms. I'm going to talk about array-based languages like MATLAB and Python's NumPy. And then I'll talk about MPI, which is the parallel programming uh, paradigm that we'll be uh, using in this class. And then I'll talk a little about a few parallel libraries that exist. Um, one of the most important is Petsy, which, um, which is really great. And, and then we'll talk about MPI for Pi, which is um, an MPI implementation for Python. And then I'll briefly mention Petsy for Pi, which is the Petsy or the Python implementation of Petsy. Um, Okay, so this image was taken from a famous article called The Free Lunch is Over. It's referring to Moore's Law, which is the law in the history of um, computing, which says that the amount of transistors that can fit into a space is doubled, um, as a rule of thumb, doubled every two years. So as we see throughout history, we've been able to achieve faster, uh, um, more computational power by being able to put transistors in a smaller area and increasing the frequency of um, monolithic processors. Though something's been happening over the last decade, you've probably noticed maybe a slowdown in the speeds of processors. I remember when I was young, you know, you'd always hear about the latest processor coming out, that um, the latest processor with the, the newest clock speed that was, you know, first whatever, 400 megahertz and then 500 and then you hit gigahertz and two gigahertz. But you haven't seen huge changes in that region lately. And the reason why is um, by some people refer, uh, the reason why is uh, we've reached a certain physical limitation. Um, some people refer to this as the heat wall. So as you fit transistors, more and more transistors into a small area and you get these um, processors moving faster and faster, they generate more and more heat. Um, as a processor becomes hotter, it becomes more unstable. And you get to a point where you're so hot that you can't dissipate enough heat fast enough that, you, uh, that your processes become unstable and you can't achieve speed ups in the same way. And so what you've seen happening lately is that um, retailers are coming out with um, uh, systems where they put more processors into one computer. So you have your dual core processors, your quad core processors. However, um, uh, and so, so you see that trend here. Um, one of the uh, issues or one of the complications with putting more processors onto a computer is that a single program is not going to achieve um, any speed up with more processors on your computer unless it's specifically designed to, um, uh, to take advantage of that that hardware architecture. So, um, but what typically happens is you have multiple applications running on your uh, on your computer. Typically, your OS is going to switch back and forth between a few um, processes, and then if you have a dual or quad core process, it'll put separate applications on different cores. Um, but um, if you want a single program to run faster, you have to design it to specifically take advantage of that. And so that's where parallel programming comes in. Um, so there's, there's a few different, um, there are a few different um, implement, or a few different paradigms in parallel programming. There's uh, distributed memory programming. There's shared memory programming. The ones that you typically hear about, um, the ones on your personal computers or laptops where you have dual core processors, that's shared memory programming, which means that all those cores on your processor they share the same same memory. Um, what we're going to be talking about in this class is distributed memory programming, and that is um, that refers to the large supercomputers like the one in um, the Crabtree Building, the, the Fulton Supercomputing Lab. Um, the Fulton Supercomputer basically is a whole bunch of personal computers. You see a whole bunch of um, pizza box slabs um, all stacked in a row, and they're all connected to each other by a local area network. 
but it's not your typical Ethernet cable. They, this particular uh, computer uses, um, uh, they use uh, a retail brand called InfiniBand, which is actually probably the most common um, uh, network uh, system used cables. And so they are extremely fast, so much faster than Ethernet cables. And so they, each of these, you know, each of these boxes have a few processors on them. Each node has a few, pro few processors on them, but they all have their own memory. And so enabled, uh, in order for them to work together um, to produce faster program speeds, they need to be, um, they need to talk to each other. Um, and so that's where NPI comes in. It's called the message passing interface. It's a standard for uh, what's this distributed memory programming. So this, um, this, uh, this table that we're looking at here just comes from a, a paper by um, Thias Gobert at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. It's just your typical uh, speed up table. This, show, this is uh, just for an elliptic, an elliptic test problem. This is solving, uh, um, this is solving, solving the uh, Poisson equation um, with, I think, uh, just um, um, with uh, what's it called? Um, I think it's uh, I can't remember with this particular paper. But anyway, um, um, here we see just the speed ups that we can achieve with um, uh, with parallel programming. So at the top, you'll Notice this is uh, this partial differential equation is solved on a mesh of about a thousand by a thousand, and you see that on one process um, and on one node, it took about 27 seconds to solve. Um, as we make the problem more complex, let's look at this one. This is about 10,000 by 10,000. It took a, it took three hours on one process and one node. But you notice that as you bump up the number of nodes and processes, you get faster and faster. And so you notice um, on 64 nodes, eight processors per node, you can save this, you can solve the same problem in 50 seconds, which is a huge speed up. Um, now, perhaps one of the most dramatic things about parallel programming is that not only does it make the problems that you solve um, faster to solve, but there are certain problems that you can't even solve in serial because you run out of memory. And so that's why you see all these NAs here. Um, for, uh, for a problem of this side, uh, size, about 33,000 by 33,000, you can't even solve them on 32, you know, 32 nodes, eight processes per node. You can't even do it still then. And that's because um, each of these nodes has a limited amount of memory on them. But as you expand to more nodes, you have more memory available so that you can actually solve these problems. Um, so parallel programming, just a, a note about, um, um, about learning parallel programming and, and doing so with Python is that, so programming usually is a tedious task, especially in languages like C or Fortran, but parallel programming um, can actually be really tedious. And some people like to joke and refer to it as schizophrenic programming because it's like multiple voices in one head. Um, so array-based languages um, are popular in the scientific community because they allow, um, they allow for a lot of convenience in programming mathematics. And so just to, just to see this on the left, um, this would be uh, the, type of, uh, the type of stuff that you would see in C or Fortran. Um, in MATLAB or Python, the same thing. It's just really easy to do. You can do it with just one line. Um, and so that comes to, so, so then we come to um, uh, MPI, um, parallel programming with Python. Python, um, um, well, so, so MPI, uh, just to, to clarify, MPI stands for the message passing interface. Um, you see here, it's a standardized and portable message passing system designed by a group of researchers from academia and industry to function on a wide variety of parallel computers. Um, also, just to note, Petsy is a great library for that. It's 
a suite of data structures that allows you to, uh, it allows for any level of abstraction you want. You can create vectors and matrices and all you have to do is specify the, uh, the, the mathematical operations that you want to do and all the parallelization is done under the hood. So you can create some really great applications really quickly. Um, it's important though to learn MPI and to get a, you know, to, to get a good uh, grounding in it so that you can understand what's really going on when, when you use things like this. Um, and actually, if you want to develop parallel algorithms yourself, then, then MPI is, is the way to go because it's sort of like the, uh, the assembly language of parallel computing. And, um, and it's so general and it's the standard. So um, Python, using Python for high performance computing actually, I think is gaining some speed. Uh, just a, just a, a week ago, I was working on this. Um, I was working on this tutorial and this this little book, and I noticed that um, the University of Texas at Austin had published um, a slideshow that was a tutorial on uh, on using Python to do MPI, and they had a, a big uh, extensive slideshow on using it. And I noticed that the date the date that it was published was like two days before I was looking at it. It was like two weeks ago. And um, which was really, you know, really crazy because there are not, you know, there are not many people using Python to do parallel computing, but it's gaining speed. And the reason why it's so great is that Python, you know, is admittedly a lot slower than languages like C or Fortran, but it's so convenient. And when parallel programming is so difficult, um, using Python, at least for prototyping, is definitely you know, a great, you know, a great tool. And it's actually um, um, when you're using NumPy or SciPy with something like this implementation, like MPI for Pi, you can, you know, it's it might even be acceptable for small or medium-sized codes, um, or for applications that don't require too much communication in your programs. So, um, so in this week of classes, we're going to be demonstrating MPI for Pi. And we're going to be using it to teach MPI, um, mainly for uh, pedagogical purposes. If you'd like you know, to learn um, the standards of MPI, the ones written in C or Fortran, you can do so. But we're going to present MPI with Python, and we're going to do it so that it mirrors the C version as closely as possible. So if you ever decide to, you know, to look up the equivalent C implementations, you'll be able to do you know, to, tr to, to cross over seamlessly. Um, we won't be talking about Petsy for Pi, but we'll talk about Petsy um, a little on Friday. Um, and um, just uh, another note about um, um, using MPI for Pi. These are just a few test problems um, that I ran. This is just simple numerical integration. And you can see as you bump up the number of processors, you can see pretty quick speed ups. And the same thing here. This is a, no, I can't, oh, this was a matrix vector product. Um, and this was done, there are two methods of message passing in MPI for Pi. There's, you can do it using um, Python's Kickle method, or you can do it using um, NumPy arrays. The NumPy arrays, I believe, are much faster. And from my short test, you can see that it's a lot faster. But anyway, I hope that um, kind of explains the importance of parallel computing and uh, some of the things that you